also known as the Body Scientist and the Renaissance Amazon. And I am here today from Havana, Cuba to make a video for you all. Um, this video is about my experiences here in Havana. Um, I was born and raised in Harlem and my dad is from St. Augustine, Florida. His uh, family is from St. Augustine, Florida for as far back as we can trace. Um, my mom is from Pennsylvania, uh, Southwestern Pennsylvania, and her dad is from Pensacola, Florida. Um, it's not often that I meet people from Florida. Usually when I do, they're from the Caribbean, and they, they came to Florida. Um, but my dad was heavily involved in the civil rights movement. Um, he went to Florida a and got kicked out for being involved in the movement, um, was a part of the organization that strategically put Black Panthers together, which actually started in Alabama, registering people to vote. Um, and he was a black radical. And I remember when I was 12 years old, my dad told me, you know, Florida Negroes were not like um, the rest of the South. Like, black people in Florida were never until yes sir, yes ma'am. Um, you know, Florida has a different history. They were runaway slaves and Seminole Indians, and they joined forces and fought together against the U.S. government. And this mixture of African and indigenous is not unique to Florida. It's not unique to New Orleans. It's something that you find all throughout the Americas. Um, and it's something that I feel like is underdocumented. Uh, but I'll be doing another video on that. Um, and so I've always felt this connection to Cuba. Um, the Spanish-speaking countries in general, Cuba in particular, and um, also Haiti. Um, I have a, a great love for Haiti, but something about Cuba has, it's like I felt my ancestors there so strong. Um, I also found my ancestors in New Orleans, even though I don't have any direct connection to New Orleans. And when I, the first time I went to New Orleans, I didn't think that that was gonna happen. I didn't really know anything about New Orleans. I went there for a conference in uh, 2007 at Tulane on um, dances of the African diaspora. And it was focused on Afro-Cuban, Haitian, Congolese, Afro-Brazilian. And uh, we had a weekend on dances um, and traditions from New Orleans. And that's why I learned about the Mardi Gras Indians and the fact that, you know, black people, which I have to put in quotes, because black people in um, America or wherever, it's all the social constructs, okay? So most of us black people are actually mixed blood. You know, most of us are part Native American, part European, so, you know. Um, but, um, what was I going to say? I just totally lost my train of thought. Oh, yeah, New Orleans, uh, black people acknowledge this African Native mixture, um, camaraderie, the fact that um, the Natives taught African stuff, that they sold things together, created together, fought together, and they give thanks for that. And so that brought tears in my eyes to see people that actually acknowledge that, you know, and do it with pride. And it's not something, again, that's only in New Orleans. We find it all throughout the Americas. Um, it's not true that all the indigenous people are there. Um, when Africans run away in Jamaica, when they run away in Cuba and Brazil, a lot of times there were native people, red people in those woods. And flora and fauna over here is different. So natives taught Africans a lot of things, and there's this huge Afro-indigenous uh, mixture in the Americas. Um, it's very obvious in Cuba, but it's very obvious to me everywhere, um, especially in like Cuba, Puerto Rico. Um, sorry, it's in like Cuba, Puerto Rico, um, and all throughout the United States. Okay. So I've always felt this big draw to Cuba. My dad, he plays the corner drums. He's very much in the Afro Cuban music and rhythms. And, I grew up in a neighborhood full of Dominicans. Dominicans who were just like me, just like my family, more African than me and my family. Um, and just, you know, being in a neighborhood that was heavily Dominican and seeing, when I was a kid and I would see them and they're speaking Spanish, I'm like, yeah, I thought that person was black. And he's like, they are black, they're a black Dominican. You know, Dominican is not a race, it's a nationality. You can be a white Dominican or a black Dominican or an Asian Dominican or a um, you know Chinese American or um, a Native or any mixture of them, just like you can be a white American, a Black American, a Chinese American, a Native American, um, and so a lot of people when they think Dominican or Puerto Rican or Cuban, they think one thing. 
they may think Jada or Ricky will pardon me. When there are Cubans that look like me, there's Cubans that look like you, and everything in between, okay? So in the history of Cuba, um, there's a lot it has in common with black people in the United States. All the Americas have a history of slavery and oppression of black and indigenous people. Um, however, Cuba, unlike a lot of the Spanish speaking countries, um, the black people in Cuba really have a strong African identity and black identity. Um, I could be around Dominicans who look just like me, and they'll tell me to my face, oh, I'm not black, you know. Um, but also, in their defense, race is defined differently in different countries. It's a social construct. The United States says one drop of black blood makes you black. That's not necessarily based on anything factual. That's what the United States made up. Not every country defines it that way. Um, and so whatever, but I'm just saying, they really, a lot of African, a lot of Dominicans run from that. Um, I know some who don't, but they're very few and far in between. Um, Afro-Cubans have a very strong, like, Afro-Cuban black identity and consciousness, just like Afro-Americans do. Um, there are many African religions that are alive in here. And it's not just uh, the Yoruba. It's also stuff from the Congo, stuff from the Dahomey. Um, stuff from Haitians, um, Haitian Blue. Um, so I, when I started studying dances of the African diaspora in 2006, and I started um, to learn about, you know, a lot, a lot of the history, a lot of our history that is not documented. Okay, the dancing teaches so much. So I, I studied Afro-Cuban dances, different styles of social and religious dances with various teachers in New York and Miami, teachers who are from Cuba. Here who had come um, to the U.S. to teach, um, also Haitian stuff. And um, there's so much I learned from doing the dances. So much that I learned that um, you can only really understand when you do those dances. And um, there's so much medicine in them. Actually, it has a really good book to recommend to you all. Hold on. Okay. This book right here, which I read many years ago, it's called Dancing Wisdom. Dancing Wisdom, Embodied Knowledge in Haitian Voodoo, Cuban Yoruba, and Bahian Kandamle by Yvonne Daniel, okay? Um, Yvonne Daniel, she is an anthropologist and a dancer, okay? A trained dancer, anthropologist, and initiated priestess in um, Afro-Brazilian tradition. And so that book is very, very important. Um, it goes into depth about the medicine in these dances. And so reading the book can teach you a lot. And then like seeking out these dances, whether you're male or female, if you have access to these classes and taking them, um, there's a lot of our history that um, you will learn um, that is encoded in these dances and a lot of medicine. Um, so when I started saying these things, I had even more of a foundation with Cuba. The literacy rate here is about five percent. People in Cuba, um, whether they clean toilets or whatever they do, they are really knowledgeable about their dances and traditions and rhythms, which is very, very rich. Um, and so, Americans, it was hard for us to go for so long. Um, I tried to go with a, a dance teacher three years ago, Afro-Cuban dance teacher in New York from Santiago. The last minute I didn't go, lost all this money, I was so sad. So as soon as the, um, the Shurchins opened up for us to go, thanks to Obama, um, I came, so I'm here. And I plan on coming here as much as I can, because who knows you know, what Trump may try to do in terms of changing that. And even then, I will still do my best to come here. Um, it's beautiful. Beautiful like I imagined, but also different from what I imagined. And again, I've only been in Havana and Old Havana. Um, I would like to go to Matanzas which has a very close connection to where I'm from. My family's from in St. Augustine. Um, and there's a lot of trouble back and forth between St. Augustine and Matanza. So Matanza stands for slaughterings. Um, and I went to go to Santiago de Cuba, which is all the way on the other side of the island. That's where there are Haitian Afro-Cubans. And Haiti has a huge history with Cuba as well, because after the Haitian Revolution, um, the Haitians that came to Cuba they scared the slave masters here in Cuba because um, Cuba didn't want the same kind of uprising that happened in Haiti, number one. Number two, if you look at the Haitian Afro-Cuban dances, which 
I have studied. Um, they're different than the Haitian dancers and they're different than the Afro Cuban dancers. And they're very high energy and aggressive, like dances for war. Okay? And when you see those dances, you can see how it could have scared slave masters. Okay? Um, so that encouraged a lot of slave masters in Cuba to let the Africans in Cuba get into groups based on where they're from in Africa um, to form societies so that um, they could so called be happier and calm. And because of that, there's a lot of um, like cultural and spiritual stuff that they contain also changed from what Africans do. And that has to do with a lot of things. One of them I feel like also their contact with Native people. Because there are Native elements in all the so-called African based traditions in the Americas. Um, if you're dealing with different spirits, different elements, you know, our African ancestors came to the Americas um, naked. Nothing. So we had to, they had to recreate drums. And so now you're making drums out of the wood here. Now you're dealing with the spirits on this land. And that changes things. Um, it changed protocol and the way things are done. Um, but yeah, so Haiti um, definitely has, you know, played a huge influence. And I, 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 I've heard great things about Santiago, and I do plan on going there. Um, Trinidad, I've heard, was also very nice. Um, and, you know, Havana, I mean, it's so black. Like, I knew there were a lot of black people here. They used to call uh, Cuba the little, little black home. Um, there are, it's very much like America, though. Like, white, black, Asian, and stuff in between, you know. Um, but a lot of black people in Havana. And a lot of them look like you could have flipped them off the street in Harlem or Brooklyn or uh, Atlanta or something, you know. Um, their swag, the way they move, the way they dress, they're fashionable. And their swag reminds me a lot of Afro-Americans, which all black people don't necessarily have that swag. Like, um, like Africans, Africans have their own swag. Africans are swagged out in an African kind of way, but it doesn't remind me of the swag of Afro-Americans. Um, here here in, um, in Havana, they do. Everybody's super sweet, but the streets here are super busy all the time. It's so funny how people stereotype New York as like, oh my god, it's a big, crazy, busy city. But here, I have never seen a street that didn't have a whole bunch of people on it. You know, when we're in Old Havana, it's like the French quarters, but way more massive. Like the building is way more streets, the buildings are way more massive, and there's way more people on the street constantly. It's like if you stop for a second, you feel like you're in somebody's way, or you are in somebody's way. Um, and so it's very lively. There's an energy in the street that reminds me of New York. Um, in Old Havana, there's live music everywhere. You know, you're walking down the street, this restaurant has an amazing band. And for those of you who know me, you know that I love um, Afro Latin music, especially Afro Cuban and Puerto Rican, stuff from Colombia. Uh, I love Afro Peruvian stuff. Um, all of them are beautiful, but Afro Cuban music, oh my God, you know, and religious salsa music gets into my, my soul. And here you have it live every five steps. Beautiful. And most of the people playing this music are dark, okay? They're black, black, black. Dark skinned black people, unmistakably black, okay? And so a lot of people, like if you go to Miami, you know, which Miami, I spent a lot of time in Miami. Miami is full of really hateful, stuck up, blatantly racist white people, okay? The ones who celebrated Castro's death. But here in Cuba, I was told that for nine days, um, they did not play music or drink for nine days out of respect for Castro. Um, black Cubans love Castro. White Cubans hate him. And part of it is that he ended segregation here. And he gave some land back to the black people. And you can clearly see when you come here that the white Cubans in Miami are definitely racist, disgusting people who are like, oh, because the black people here, the uh, indigenous people here are super beautiful. Super, you know, in a good mood. They love Obama. You know, they're free-thinking, intelligent people. They're not all racist. And there are white people who I've seen here, and again, I haven't been over the whole island. But this is Havana, Old Havana. The white people I've seen here seem to be cool with the black people. It's, you know, it's all good. But in Miami, all the times I've been in Miami, which have been several, there are plenty of times that I've walked into a business, a, a Cuban business, of course, as white Cubans. And as I'm talking to them, they're like backing up. They don't want me to touch them down, they don't want to breathe my air, and it's 
very obvious. Um, sometimes they have nobody in the business, but it's like, they don't want my money, they just want me to get out. Um, I remember years ago dancing salsa uh, down on South Beach, and these uh, white Cubans looking at me like, you know, like, how does she know how to dance like that? It's like, first of all, I could be Cuban or Puerto Rican because there's plenty of them that look just like me. But regardless of that, salsa is a black dance. It comes from black people in Cuba. Rumba, the true rumba, comes from black people in Cuba. Okay, people who are black than me, people who have my color and the darker. It doesn't come from the white people, the Gloria Esteban and all her white musicians. And when I was a kid, my dad always used to point it out to me. He said, this is afro Cuban. The people that Gloria Esteban has on stage and her and all that, that is not the face of this music. It's just, it's just like if uh, people said that jazz and hip hop and rhythm and blues um, and soul music was all just American music. And we have white people representing it, you know, everywhere. So if people thought of hip hop and jazz and R&B, they think of it as white American music. And it's not it comes from the black people. They try to erase us in that way. There would be no beautiful Afro-Cuban art and music without the black people, period. Okay, let's get that clear. Um, so, there's also lots of bosses in Havana and over there, a lot of locks, especially in the men. Um, and what else did I see? Um, just people dancing and music. Everybody seems happy and in a good mood. I feel very safe, you know. And I've never heard of anybody say anything bad about Cuba. Um, but, but it's very difficult to get on the internet. Um, it's like you can only get on for like an hour at a time. I don't know if it's an hour a day or an hour at a time, but you have to go buy a certain card um, that's like four or five, six dollars to get online for an hour. You can only do it in the parks or if you're staying in a hotel, which I'm not. But if you're staying in a hotel, um, they have the hotels. Or um, you have to go to the park. Not even like an internet cafe in the park. Uh, you can't really upload videos or do anything major. Um, and so. I, I feel like, you know, Cuba could grow a lot with the internet. Um, right now, the place I found, I found an Airbnb. Um, and I'm having a, a great experience. I found a place to myself for $29 a night. Uh, so, as Americans, we can now go online, book tickets to Cuba. And um, I booked mine on JetBlue. It was $99 each way. Um, and then $29 a night to stay at an Airbnb place by myself. I can leave out and I can walk to get some food or go out to the internet park. But um, I think it would be a hard place to be if you don't speak any Spanish because most people are people that don't speak English. And you'll have a pretty hard time unless you can hire someone to you know, travel with you and translate, or you have someone to translate. You should be able to speak some Spanish uh, here. And I love it because like, I understand a lot of Spanish, but I'm not able to speak it, as express myself the way I would like to. But even when I tell people that, they don't care. They still keep talking to me. And I've had, like, very intelligent, high-level, in-depth conversations with people here. Um, everybody, it's like people, people want to talk to you. Um, they're, you know, selling books everywhere. All the books have to do with Revolution and Castro and Che Guevara and Black Panthers. Now, I don't see silly books here, like romance novels and Eric Jones novels and just ghetto dumb shit. I don't see that. Everything is very serious. Um, but people here are very intelligent, you know. Um, the literacy rate here is 95%. I think in the U.S. it's like 70. Um, when I was in Haiti six years ago, the ill literacy rate in Haiti was 95%. Uh, somebody just corrected me and told me it was 80%, but still that's a lot of uh, illiteracy rate. So the fact that people are 95% literate, they don't really have access to the internet, and they have all these books that are like highly Intelligent. Like I saw these books on um, like indigenous artifacts in Cuba and Aboriginal art in Cuba and in-depth histories of Los Negros in Cuba and the spiritual traditions in Cuba or books on just the foods to feed certain deities, certain African deities in Cuba. Um, very complex histories and uh, written by many scholars. And so you see a lot of that here and they're very um, aware and intelligent. And despite it, um, the United States doing what it's done to Cuba, the Cubans that I've bumped into, they have a love for America and they would like to go. Um, I feel like Cubans are very talented, intelligent people, and they have a lot to offer the world. So, you know, being able to have more internet access would be good, a good thing. However, 
um, I will say that um, the more internet access it seems like the rest of us have, the dumber we get. Uh, people nowadays seem pretty dumb too. But um, when we have the internet, we have access to all this stuff, people should be smart enough to that. Um, here I see really smart people. And, um, but I think Cuba has been the way it's been for so long, I don't think that the internet can completely change them. And possibly maybe the younger generation we never know. But I just feel like they're, you know, a lot further ahead than a lot of people when it comes to this intelligence and still reading books, you know, critical thinking skills, you know, uh, good people. And so coming here, you can definitely see the difference. If you've ever spent time in Miami between the white, stuck-up, racist Cubans there who celebrated Castro's death and the ones here who, who honored him. Um, also, depending on where you are in Cuba or in Havana, I mean, not, let me stop saying Cuba because I haven't been all the island, but in Havana, old Havana, um, I'm staying in a place called Madado in Havana. Depending on where you're staying, some places are kind of rough. There are places that don't have running water. Um, where I'm staying, I do. Um, I do have hot water heater, so I can heat my cold water to a hot shower. Um, there's no refrigerator where I'm at, um, but it's clean in the same area. But I've also seen other people who don't uh, have running water and flushing the toilet and taking a bath uh, is a big ordeal. So if coming here, you want to look at those, look into those kind of things. Also, the fact that we cannot uh, get more money out as Americans. You have to come here with whatever money you're going to spend, um, and. Um, it's better to exchange American money into euros or Canadian money first, because if you just do it from American money to Cuban money, you lose a, a significant amount, since the, the euro or Canadian money is now worth more here. Um, and if you play it safe, and that, because you could go to places in like Old Havana or places that are priced like the U.S., where a meal is ten dollars, twelve dollars, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen dollars. But a lot of places you can get a full meal for two dollars. Like last night, I had a plate full of shrimp. No, no, no. It was a plate full of fish. It was some type of white fish from Cuba. I had never heard of it. Plate full of fish, a lot of moro, which is um, like rice and beans cooked together. The way Jamaicans make rice and beans, except for black beans and cassava chips. And that was two dollars and ten cents. And then I had um, a tall glass of pineapple juice made from fresh pineapples. The pineapples here are white. Um, and that was 40 cents, and so it was 250. And earlier that day, when I was in Old Havana, where there was more tourists, I had a plate of shrimp and moil um, for six dollars. Okay, so six dollars even you know costly, um, but it's still a lot cheaper than the U.S. Um, and I love the batidos, which are like fruit and milk. You can get those for like three dollars, depending on where you're getting it from. So you can eat here pretty, pretty cheaply. Um, and there's a lot of really beautiful Cuban art. Um, so when I come back, I'm going to bring money to buy some Cuban art. Um, because you can get beautiful pieces that are not super costly. But again, as Americans, you have to be careful because once you're here, we cannot get more money out. Um, but it is not illegal for us to come. So I do suggest going, um, especially if you're black. And especially if you're a black person who's interested in stay black and die kind of people who are conscious of who they are and are not trying to bleach their skin and run from who they are and have very rooted Afro-African, Afro-Indigenous traditions. Um, I would suggest to check out Cuba. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go get something to eat and do some more work and enjoy the rest of my day. So I hope you all like this video and if you do, share it and let's support Cuba. Okay, bye.